All right, there we go. So um, some announcements to make. So Friday, next week Friday, not this Friday, which would be the 19th is test two. So coming up, um, again, check the test two folder. The PowerPoint I put up for Friday is most likely going to be the last um, PowerPoint that's going to be on test two. Um, make sure you go and do the practice tests. See, you know, what kind of questions I asked beforehand. Um, the questions are kind of, going to, kind of going to be like in the same format as in test one, you know, a lot of short answer, um, some multiple choice. So just so you're aware, that is next week, Friday. As a reminder, where we were, what we talked about, we've been talking about protein structure and protein folding for the last week or so. And so the last thing was uh, quaternary structure. And then we talked about how we have a hydrophobic collapse and there can be other interactions that help stabilize uh, folded protein. And then the last thing we talked about is this Infanson experiment where you unfold our ribonuclease A and then you refold it and you see that it folds correctly. And what that tells you is that primary structure, that is the N to C terminus amino acid, just the sequence, primary structure dictates tertiary structure. So the order of amino acids dictates what the structure of the protein will be. And the next thing I want to talk about is something called an intrinsically disordered protein or IDP. So up to this point in the class, I've always talked about structured proteins, proteins that have a 3D structure. However, there are a good percentage of proteins that don't have any set structure. They're like wet spaghetti noodles that constantly change. This is called an intrinsically disordered protein or IDP. The picture on your left is an example of an IDP that actually gains structure when it binds its target. So on the left-hand side here is the uh, intrinsically disordered form of the protein. And when it binds, it forms this nice helix and now it's ordered. Not all IDPs behave this way. Um, not all IDPs get structure when they bind something. Um, some just remain uh, disordered forever. So what type of amino acids make up an IDP? Well, you have charged amino acids and that makes sense because if, if the amino acids are charged, I'll say they're all positive charges, right? they're going to want to separate from each other. And if they were folded, they would have to come in contact with each other, which they don't want to do. So charge amino acids and no hydrophobic groups or minimal hydrophobic groups. Again, this makes sense. When we talked about globular proteins and anytime you hear the word globular, all that means is like folded and it, it's just like folded into a bowl more or less. That's kind of how you can think of it. So globular proteins, when they fold, they put their hydrophobic residues in towards the center of the protein. IDPs don't have a lot of hydrophobic groups because if they did, they would fold. So to keep it as an IDP, you don't have a lot of these groups. Um, a lot of proteins have IDP segments. So it could be that the protein itself isn't an IDP. The protein itself has sequence, but parts of the protein don't have sequence. Um, if I'm gonna use like this white protein as an example, like this white protein would be folded and then you could have an IDP sticking out of it. Um, a lot of pro proteins have this for like different functional re reasons. Um, like just for example, you can put phosphates on these 
on these IBP segments and give it function and that changes how the whole protein works. That's just one example of why IDPs would be on a folded protein. Um, but interestingly enough, if we look at prokaryotic proteins, they don't really have IDP segments. They're not, they don't have a lot of IDP. So this seems to be a, a eukaryotic uh, advancement in proteins. There are a lot of proteins that are IDPs that are also um, related to disease. So that's why I have disease associated proteins there. A lot of IDPs are, are related to diseases. Um, otherwise, normally what IDPs do, uh, signaling, like I was talking about in this phosphate, um, regulation, which is, can also be done by phosphates. You put a tag on the IDP, you give it structure, and that tells the protein some information. Um, while ordered proteins, they're usually, you know, enzyme transport and structural. So that's what IDPs are really doing, signaling regulation functions for the most part. And so here, I just have some questions. Again, these are good review questions when you're going back, make sure you understand these. Um, and A, I kind of just talked about it. Why do IDPs contain more hydrophilic than hydrophobic residues? Again, it's, um, you don't want that hydrophobic collapse. You don't want the hydrophobic residues to go in the center or else you would have a folded protein. So that's why it's mostly hydrophilic so you can remain without structure, but soluble. And here B, polylysine assumes a random coil. All right, so just some terminology for us. The word random coil, that means IDP. So why does a polylyse assume a random coil? Again, this is something I just talked about on the last slide. So um, if you have a bunch of charged residues, they will want to remain separate from each other instead of folding and, and having to be in close contact with each other. So that's why if a protein is made out of nothing but lysine, it's gonna be an IDP. However, it is possible to make it into an alpha helix. And if you remember when we talked about secondary structure, alpha helix looks like this, more or less. And you have residues that are close in contact with each other. So the side chains will be in close contact with each other. So under what conditions might this work? Well, for this to work, you'd have to remove the um, positive charge off the lysine. So if lysine becomes neutral, which it can in areas of high pH, so if it becomes basic, lysine can lose that proton, lysine will become neutral, and then polylyse would no longer become an IDP, it would become an alpha helix. So that's all the discussion that um, we had to catch up from Monday, just finishing off um, this IDP discussion. Um, any questions about IDPs or anything at all while I uh, switch to the next PowerPoint here? Let me get this up. This up. All right. So let's talk about the material I had planned for today. And we are finally done just talking about proteins in general, at least for right now. So now we're going to look at two specific proteins, myoglobin and hemoglobin. And we're going to look at these because one, they're well-studied proteins. 
but also because they had they're going to show us how proteins bind molecules right so they're going to be our example of protein binding ligands and what we learn with hemoglobin and myoglobin you can apply to many different proteins so it's a good model system for us so first off what is myoglobin myoglobin will transport um, oxygen inside your cells. So it's, a, it's the cellular way to transport oxygen. And you have a lot of myoglobin in your muscles. And myoglobin can also be thought as um, like storage for oxygen. So when you're under low oxygen conditions. For example, when you're working out, myoglobin can release that oxygen to your muscles. So your muscles can still do oxidative phosphorylation. So myoglobin's main goal is just to move oxygen uh, from, the, from the blood inside the cell to the mitochondria and deliver that oxygen to the mitochondria. So how does it do that? Well, the way that myoglobin carries oxygen is through what's called a heme. And a heme is this ring-like structure that has iron in the middle. So there's an iron molecule and this iron is surrounded by a bunch of different residues. Two important residues are called the proximal histidine and the distal histidine, right? These are uh, the two amino acids that are going to be interacting most with the system. Right, so to transport oxygen, the way it works in myoglobin is that this oxygen uh, molecule will interact with the iron inside the heme ring and it will also interact with the histidine, the distal histidine. It does not, does not interact with the proximal histidine. The proximal histidine instead just interacts with the iron molecule. And that's how myoglobin and actually hemoglobin carries oxygen around. Now let's talk about binding curves for ligands and Again, our example here is going to be myoglobin. So to know how much myoglobin is bound to oxygen or what percentage has oxygen bound, we have this equation up here. So this YO2, and it's also down on this graph, this YO2, you can think of it as percent of myoglobin bound to oxygen, where a score of zero means no, no oxygen is bound. Or I guess no myoglobin has oxygen. Score of one means 100% of myoglobin has oxygen bound. And our equation for this is that the concentration of oxygen divided by this K plus O2 gives us our percentage of myoglobin bound. So first off, what is this K? K is a dissociation constant. And the way to think about this is the lower your K is, the higher affinity you have to binding. So really low numbers mean you want to bind your ligand very tightly. All right, so that's what K is. It's called a dissociation constant. Low numbers are equal tighter binding. Now, when we're talking about binding, this is our equation up here for general binding. However, 
if you're talking about gases, if you remember back from general chemistry, to talk about concentration of gases, we actually talk about pressure. We don't talk about molarity, which is these brackets. We talk about pressure. So in terms of uh, this binding curve for myoglobin, we change the, equa the equation to be pressure of oxygen divided by dissociation constant plus pressure of oxygen. Now, how do we find this value K? How do we find KD? And by the way, I know I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna say KD instead of K a lot. KD just is another way to say dissociation constant. That D stands for dissociation. And I just do that because there's other Ks. So I just want, so to be clear, if I say K, D during this, I mean K. All right, so how do we find this dissociation constant? Well, we can actually do that through experimentation. Let's say we did an experiment where we were able to measure what percentage of myoglobin were bound to oxygen at different pressures of oxygen. And that's what the graph is showing here. Fraction bound on the Y and pressure of oxygen on the X. And we can get this nice curve here. Now to find dissociation constant, you, you need to find um, the halfway point between bound and unbound. So you go to where YO2 is 0 0.50. That's called a, uh, the 50% bound. And you draw a line until you hit your curve. Once you hit your curve, draw a line down to the x-axis. And whatever pressure this is, and this looks to be roughly like 2.8, that is called P50. P50 is the pressure at which 50% of your molecule is bound to the ligand. That's also your dissociation constant. So P50 in our case is KD. So you can get KD from a graph by graphing fraction bound over ligand concentration, finding the 50% where it is on the graph and dropping it down to the ligand concentration. That gives you KD. All right, before I move on to looking at some uh, uh, actual problems, is there any questions about the information that we went over here? All right, let's take a look here on actually using this information now. So here's a question. On the left-hand part of the table, I have ligand concentrations in millimolar. On the right-hand side, I have our Y. What I want you to do is I want you to roughly estimate based on the information in this table, what is KD? So I'll give you like a minute or two to do that. If you have questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll be back um, in a minute with the answer.
All right, so let's let's take a look at this data, right? So remember what I said previously is that K, the value of K, the way you get that is you, it's the ligand concentration when Y equals 50 or 0.5 rather, when I'm half bound, half unbound. So for here, we don't actually have a value of uh, 0.50. So there's a couple of ways to do this. If you were serious about this, um, like if you're doing this for a real experiment or a real trial, you would graph this and you would have the computer tell you, okay, what is the value of 0.50? Here, we can just eyeball it. So it's somewhere between 0.5 and 0.8. Um, so just as a guesstimate, it would be roughly, uh, I don't know, let's say 0.65 the exact halfway point between 0.5 and 0.8. So we can say that K is roughly 0.65 millimolar because that is the concentration of ligand that you need to add to be Y equals 0.5 or another word for Y is fractional saturation. So I'll also use that quite a bit. Again, just remember what percent of ligand is bound. And our K is the 50% point. Right, questions about K data, myoglobin, anything up to this point. Moving on. So that was myoglobin. Myoglobin is relatively easy because myoglobin can only bind one thing at a time. Myoglobin only has one binding site. So let's talk about the more interesting case of hemoglobin, right? So hemoglobin is what, what is called a tetrameric protein. If you remember your prefixes, tetra means four. So a tetrameric protein means it's made out of four different proteins combined together, right? And this is found in your red blood cells. It's called an alpha-2, beta-2 tetramer. What that means is that two proteins are called alpha proteins, two proteins are called beta proteins. The alpha proteins are identical to each other and the beta proteins are identical to each other. And hemoglobin, when you look at it, it looks very, very similar to myoglobin. If you overlay the two images, uh, they, they look very similar, which makes sense. Um, hemoglobin also carries around oxygen inside the body. And we talked about previously if proteins have the same function, they will look the same. So both hemoglobin and myoglobin have similar functions, not exactly 100% the same, but they both carry oxygen and heme, so they look the same. Now, hemoglobin has two different forms called the deoxy and oxy forms. And upon oxygen binding, you have big conformational changes in the protein. So there's a word I don't believe I've, I've talked about before. So conformational change. Whenever I say the word conformational change, all I'm talking about is a 3D change in protein structure. So the protein is changing what it looks like, the conformational change. And so big changes happen all throughout the protein. Um, the changes that happen the most are where these alpha and beta proteins are interacting. So I drew a little cartoon up here, kind of small. Um, let me draw it a little bit bigger, right? 
This in essence is actually how hemoglobin looks like where you have an alpha protein here and an alpha protein here, beta protein here, beta protein here. I'll just number them one, one, two, two. And so at these interfaces, that's why I say alpha one, beta one, alpha two, beta, uh, beta two, and alpha one, beta uh, two interfaces. It's at these interfaces where you have a lot of shifting, a lot of changes in protein structure. But you also have a big change. Let me get a different color pen here. You also have a big change in the center. All right, and that's what I'm trying, or this image is trying to show here. So if I'm going to draw my crappy little cartoon over this image of the protein, uh, let's see. So that's A, actually it should be like that, A, A, B. I cannot draw for the life of me, but like, so that's alpha, alpha, beta, beta. Uh, the way to really look at this is this is the heme group right here. And next to that is the uh, Greek letter telling you what subunit it is. But interestingly, in the deoxy form, which is blue, in the oxy form, the gap between the four subunits uh, can grow or shrink. So when you don't have oxygen, the, the gap in the center between the four subunits is big, while the gap in the oxygen form is small. And hemoglobin has something called a sigmoidal binding curve. So whenever you see the word sigmoidal, just remember the S in sigmoidal, that means the binding curve looks more like an S. Not quite that, more like, there we go. More like that kind of S. So let's take a look at how the binding curve of myoglobin and hemoglobin are different. And that's being shown over here on the right. So myoglobin that we just talked about has more of a hyperbolic curve. And this is more sigmoidal. So you can see at low pressures, like pressures that are even lower than are what in your veins, myoglobin is like 90%. 90% uh, of myoglobin has oxygen at very low oxygen pressures. While hemoglobin, hardly any hemoglobin is bound to oxygen at very low pressures. However, in your arteries, you have high levels of hemoglobin being bound to oxygen at these high pressures. So what a sigmoidal binding curve tells us and what we're looking at for hemoglobin is that it has what is called cooperative binding. What cooperative binding means is that when you bind one ligand, your other binding sites want to bind those ligands as well. So let's take a look at what that means for um, hemoglobin. I'm gonna clear all my scruples out here. So hemoglobin can bind four oxygens. So hemoglobin can bind four oxygen molecules because it has four hemes. Now, what does a cooperative binding mean? That means if one oxygen molecule binds one heme, the other three hemes will want to bind oxygen even more now. Their affinity for oxygen goes up when one oxygen binds a site. The other three sites also go up. This is called positive cooperativity. The binding of one ligand makes you want to bind other ligands. That's not the only type of cooper cooperativity. You can also have what's called negative cooperativity. And what negative cooperativity would be is that if you bind one oxygen molecule, 
the other three sites don't want to bind oxygen. But that's not what we're seeing here. We're seeing our positive cooperativity. We bind one oxygen, we want to bind the other ones. And positive cooperativity, the way you know you have positive cooperativity is that you always have this sigmoidal curve on this binding plot. All right, so with all of that, is there any, inf any questions that might have or anything you want me to go over again or anything at all uh, with the information presented here? All right, can move on now. So let's see if we can actually decide, you know, when we have cooperative binding or not. So I have two different plots for you. And they're, they're actually this data tables. I have A and B. What I want you to do is I want you to tell me based on these data, which one, which of these molecules or which of this data set is showing us cooperative lake and binding? I do have a hint here. It's a lot easier to see that if you have a plot of this data. So try and plot this data out. I'll give you a couple minutes to do that and see if you can figure out which one is showing cooperative binding. Is it A or B? All right, so hopefully you got somewhere with the plotting. Let me dust off your Excel skills. Um, I actually just popped these into Excel. So let me let me share Excel here really quick. I want this one. All right, so here are the two data uh, sets that I, I have um, graphed using Excel. And you can see B has more of that S shape than A does. So even so, I didn't actually plot zero, zero, which I should have. Um, so it should actually go like this. So B is much more of a sigmoidal than A. Again, let's talk about why we have this sigmoidal curve for cooperative binding. In co positive cooperative binding, the first molecule is the hardest to bind. Because after the first molecule binds, the other binding sites 
have a higher affinity for binding at that point. So their affinity for binding goes up, it becomes easier to bind ligands. And so it's like hard, 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 easier, easier, easier. Now it's, we're saturated. Like, like most of the binding sites are now bound. Um, that's why we get up to like 80% here. When you just have a regular curve, that means there is no cooperativity happening. Um, binding of one molecule is not affecting binding of another molecule. All right, so any, any questions about our cooperative binding, how to find that on a graph, anything about hemoglobin or anything at all up to this point? Sorry if you are hearing that banging sound of my window being open and my blinds hitting against the wall. All right, so let me go back to the PowerPoint here. All right, so let's talk about hill blocks now. And what a hill plot is, it's a way to tell us if a protein is actually cooperative or not, right? So we just looked at how binding curves, how we do that, and we can see from the curve, you know, is it a sigmoidal? Is it not? Based on that, we can say if something has cooperativity. There's actually a, a, um, a plot that will tell us that exactly. So the hill plot, the whole point of the hill plot is to tell us you know, how cooperative or is there any cooperativity um, in our protein when it comes to binding a lichen. So this is the plot on the y-axis. We have fractional saturation divided by one minus fractional saturation. So that's a weird unit, but that's what we're plotting on the y. And plotting on the x, we have pressure of our lichen. So uh, same there. And then we plot our data. And what we're going to do is we're going to measure the slope. Now, if your slope is one, which we see here for myoglobin, myoglobin is a perfectly straight line. That slope is the hill coefficient. And what the Hill coefficient tells us is that, is that if you're equal to one, you have no cooperativity. Now, if you get a plot that isn't a straight line, you want to take the slope of where it's not like straight. So we're taking the slope of this portion of the line. One second. So now mute the dog barking outside. So you take the slope of um, where it's not like a straight line and you measure the value. So in the little area I just drew there, the slope is roughly three. So what that tells you is that you have positive cooperativity. So what I want you to take away from the hill plot, don't worry about the math I have up there right now. Uh, we can kind of skip that uh, due to time's sake. The, the main takeaways that I want you to know from this slide. One, the hill plot is used to tell you the levels of cooperativity in a protein. And then two, what are the values of the hill plot? So if n equals one, you have positive cooperativity. If n is less than one, you have negative cooperativity. And again, negative cooperativity means if you bind something, you don't want to bind 
uh, that ligand again to your different site. So affinity decreases and N equals one is no cooperativity. That it doesn't matter when you bind the ligand, your other sites don't care. Uh, one question I usually get when I get to this information is that on the reading guides, I have a question, um, is N equals zero possible for a Hill coefficient? And the answer to that is no. Um, your value has to be greater than zero. Uh, zero on the Hill plot means you have a slope of zero, which really wouldn't make sense. That would, that would mean like, so if I have a slope of zero, it would like look like that, which makes absolutely no sense because like either you're not binding something or like it's stuck to you. So N of zero, impossible, but these are your, the three cases for Hill coefficients, greater than one, less than one, equal to one. Uh, know what a Hill plot is used for. And that's probably the only thing I'm gonna ask you about Hill plots on the test, the, those two questions. Right, so any, any questions about that when it comes to a uh, Hill plot? So here is a question. Um, so again, this has to do with the math. And I just said, we're not gonna worry too much about the math because I'm not gonna actually ask you a question about this. So uh, feel free to just skip this. Um, we won't be doing uh, like math with the Hill, Hill coefficients at this point where we just need to know what a Hill plot is and what the different values of N mean. So we can skip question three. And question four, um, what I think I will do for uh, question four is that I know how long this question takes. Um, it takes more than four minutes. So um, let me think about if we're gonna do something like this, but uh, let's leave question four for tomorrow, uh, Friday. Um, this will be one of the first things I tackle um, to show you how it's done. Just cause it takes a while, um, more than four minutes at least. So we'll leave this for right now um, and we'll call it early because that's all the slides I have prepared for today. So it looks like we're right on track. We're right on time. Um, reminder, like I said at the beginning, next week, Friday is test two. Tomorrow's, not tomorrow, Friday's lecture will be the last lecture that we cover for exam two. Um, anything next week will be on exam three. I'll put a homework up as always. If you have any questions, please never hesitate to reach out to me. I'm, I will answer one account. And with that, that's all I have. Thank you for uh, uh, coming or watching this on YouTube. And I will see people hopefully on Friday. Have a good rest of your week, everybody.